In time, this fact would turn into a lightning rod for the other half of America, as I discovered soon enough. In early February, I went to D.C. to meet the president on some legal matters. I can't remember the details. Another of the lawsuits for a woman he had allegedly tried to force himself on. No doubt, but I do remember the trip very well. I stayed at the Trump International Hotel in the old post office and took a limo to the White House. It was like the first day I went to see the boss in Trump Tower, with my name left at security as confirmation that I really wasn't dreaming, only now it was freaking the White House. I was shown into the West Bank, walking along a corridor and saying a polite hello to Jared Kushner who had a small office down the hall from the Oval. In the summer before the election, I told a reporter for Fanity Fair, Emily Jane Fox, that I had take, I would take a bullet for Trump, and I meant it. This book is written by Michael Cohen, who was an extreme big fan of Donald Trump. And it's an unbiased view from my point of view, how I'm trying to read it, because I don't know the president really well, so I'm trying to read every aspect of him for good and bad. Um, I am trying to see like a man who is so fond of him, who would take a bullet for Donald Trump, like what he projected when he was in love with Donald Trump. Trump was expecting me, and he saw me in the ante room, called a train to me. Get in here, Trump cleared out the oval. I need Michael alone, he said as the aides filled, filed out. He turned to me, is this place unbelievable or what? He swept his arms to show off the majesty of the space, as if he were displaying his booty of gold pieces of eight from a pirate's raid giddy at the sight of his treasure. He showed me the oil painting of George Washington with a white grin. Can you believe this, Trump said, from 2011 to today? The history, the desk, everything. For the next 15 minutes, he gave me a tour of his space with the resolute desk and the Winston Churchill bust on display. Trump showed me the gold drapes he had installed along with the portrait of Andrew Old Hickory Jackson, the charismatic 1830s president that Steve Bannon had convinced the historically ignorant Trump he most resembled for his populism and bluster. And all this love for gold comes from like, if you believe in previous life, like he was the first Roman king and also, also like, Trump was George Washington's energy, so that's why he can make it so big so easily because all this is like the past incarnation if you were to believe if you're not Christian. For the first 15, um, what do you think about the travel ban, Trump said. No, you mean the Muslim ban, I replied. I hate it. It's disgraceful. I thought your first policy rollout was going to be infrastructure. That was Bannon and Stephen Miller, Trump said. They'll fix it the next time around. So when he quotes Michael Cohen quotes Trump a lot, and that's the only time that I think that he's not being true because I don't remember what people said like yesterday or day before yesterday. So in journalism, usually you use a tape recorder and then you can quote it, but, you, but he's going off like he remembers what Donald Trump said and that is many years ago anyway chapter 16 is what I'm just 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 reading it's called Typhoon Stormy and this is why Michael Cohen went to jail um, for all the lies that he committed for his boss apparently so I'm only gonna read like these 36 pages hopefully you'll forgive me for my accent and my personal commentary the Wall Street Journal story in early January of 2018 caused a shitstorm of biblical proportions, even by the Trump presidency standards. 
it was reported that I had paid Stormy Daniels 130000 through a Delaware company called Essential Consulting LLC in the days before the 2016 election. That was perfectly true, as the world now knows. But at the time, I was fully dedicated to enforcing the NDA with Daniels and making sure she was silenced in order to protect Trump. I will spare you, gentle reader, all the tawdry details of ensuing weeks as I started legal proceedings against Daniels and her attorney, a charmer named Michael Avenatti, who rolled out their campaign to make money from the porn stars encounter with Trump more than a decade later. And she just wanted to sleep with a celebrity anyway. As the cable news talking heads exploded and I went from being Trump's personal attorney to a household name, events started to move incredibly quickly. Stormy Daniels went from being a small time porn impresario to the most famous adult actress in history. Thanks to the coordinated and sophisticated media campaign with her teasing the nation on 60 Minutes and slyly hinting about her knowledge of the president's genitals. A swirl of news that remains hard to believe actually happened in the real world. But remember, this was the real Trump's reality. I mean, who doesn't want to get famous? So he was a nobody. She wouldn't make the news so big. The simultaneous nature of the ensuing chaos can be shown first by way of example. Around the same time, the book Fire and Fury was published, and immediately it went to number one on the bestsellers list, triggering a series of events that un- that upended the nation's politics and resulted in yours truly writing this account from the sewage treatment plant in federal prison camp. I read the book and was unimpressed. The author captured some of the chaos around Trump, I could see, but he was barely even an outsider. Some schlub reporter sitting on a couch in the hallway of the White House was suddenly the author with the best access to Donald Trump. The whole idea seemed preposterous to me, giving me inspiration to write my own book about me and the boss one that would be far more intimate. The idea was to portray Trump's real estate deals and the genius he had displayed as a companion to the art of the deal. The story about Trump's acquisition of 40 Wall Street in the 1990s showed how incredibly smart he could be in real estate, despite his many failings and weaknesses in other areas of life. For years, Trump claimed to have purchased the landmark downtown skyscraper for $1 million boasting repeatedly on The Apprentice that it was worth hundreds of millions. Whatever the truth of the purchase price, it was undisputable that he had cleaned up on the deal by buying the 70-story New Gothic 1920 skyscraper in a real estate slump for pennies on the dollar. The Kluge estate Doral Mark Lago, the giant hired in the 80s for all the frantic and non-stop news that always surrounded Trump, it was clear that when it came to real estate, his father had taught him well. There truly is a method to the madness, I wrote in the book proposal, and people who think otherwise can quickly get buried. Trump revolution, from the tower to the White House, understanding Donald J. Trump was the title I was thinking about. I had a ghostwriter and fancy agent to represent the project and we drew up a proposal that outlined the basic approach. Unlike others writing about Trump, I wrote I really had known the man for a decade. I promised to write about the Russia investigation and my role, continuing to lie about the Moscow Tower deal, of course, and I was going to seek revenge on reporters I thought I had dealt unfairly, reporters I thought had dealt unfairly with the boss and me. But I couldn't leave sleeping dogs alone, of course, So I also promised to clear up the unfortunate saga of Stormy Daniels and the $130,000 I had paid her in the week before the 2016 election. I wasn't going to reveal the fact that I had been repaid the money by Trump in the form of fake legal fees or that I had done everything at the direction of the President of the United States. Needless to say, the proposal was 20 pages long and really didn't amount to much, at least not to my thinking. The White House let it be known that the president preferred that I didn't write a book without saying why. 
I figured it was because of my role as his longtime attorney and the Stormy Daniels story and the risk of further fanning those flames. To sell the book, I did a roadshow with my agent, meeting with the top editors for the five largest publishing houses in New York, and the feedback was very good. There was a lot of interest in a book that portrayed Trump in a new way. Even if I was going to pull many, many punches, I was going to be truthful. But I also had a good reason to be economical with the truth because here is the thing, I care for Donald Trump even to this day and I had and still have a lot of affection for him. This is really important. He really, really loves Donald Trump. I mean, 10 years, even after you break up with somebody, it's a big deal. You have some good memories. You wouldn't just be like saying I would take a bullet for Donald Trump. And Donald Trump really didn't do anything bad to him, so he has no reason to hate him. In any event, there was a handshake deal with the publisher Hatchet. As I hit pause to think through the reaction of the White House and to decide if given the complexities, I really wanted to go through with a book. Even a limited portrait that didn't show Trump screwing vendors or taking advantage of old friends in a cutthroat way. Then the book proposed leak to the Daily Beast and all hell broke loose. I don't know exactly who leaked the proposal, but I have a pretty good idea that it was one of the publishing houses that didn't acquire the title, a pretty act, a petty act of petulance that had mind-bending consequences. The root of all that followed lay in the simple fact that Stormy Daniels wanted to tell the story, sell her story, and she didn't want me to beat her to the payday. At least, that's my best guess, because her reaction came as soon as the story ran and the media madness began to show the first signs of emerging. The true genesis of all that ensued lay in the revelation of the amount of money that I would receive as an advance for the book, 500000 In the days that followed, I screamed and bullied and misled reporters I had known for years, all in the service of trying to stop the truth from emerging. The long and the short of it all was that Daniels wanted to cash in, and after she fired Keith Davidson and took up with the charming, I'm being sarcastic of course, Michael Levinati, the outcome was inevitable, at least in the hindsight. There was never going to be any Trump book of course, and the only thing I was going to author was catastrophe. Statements of Daniel were issued, legal proceedings were brought to get was brought to get to restraining order, but Daniels was clearly going to talk at some point. The Karen McDougall story also surfaced, to the fury of David Pecker, but that story didn't excite and tintillate the imagination of the nation in quite the same way as the Daniels story. In the end, there was no way to stop the sources leaking to the major newspapers and the, new and the networks about the payment to Daniels. And once I was forced to admit to it, I issued a statement to the New York Times. The headline appeared on page 12 of the Times of the Morning of February 14, 2018. It succinctly summarized my role in the latest twist in the tawdry tale of Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels. Trump's longtime lawyer says he paid actress out of his own pocket. Neither the Trump organization nor the Trump campaign was party to the transaction with Mr. Clifford, and neither reimbursed me for the payment, either directly or indirectly. My statement said the payment to Ms. Clifford was lawful and was not a campaign contribution or a campaign expenditure by anyone. I added the bromide I had used to convince Trump to make the payment in the first place. Just because something isn't true doesn't mean that it can't cause you harm or damage. Of course, as you know, I was lying. I had been reimbursed for the payments, plus money for income tax on the sum, plus a bonus, but that was no one's business as far as I was concerned. The Times reporter was Maggie Heberman. As I have mentioned, Maggie and I often exchange information and gossip and tips, but this latest conversation verged at on the absurd. Was I really expecting the world to believe I had spent 130000 of my own money to hide the sexual past 
of Donald Trump after issuing the statement, I refused to answer follow-up questions apart from saying it was a private transaction and the Trump and that Trump had no knowledge of the payment. Maggie noted in her piece that I had relied on the same seemingly true aphorism during the tam- campaign to explain why I had supposedly made the payment to Daniels. Even false information about Trump could cause him harm if it were published. But the premise of my explanation left obvious questions. Why would a lawyer, any lawyer, play pay a client's expenses without their knowledge. Was that legal, ethical, rational? Cable television lit up in response, as usual, with liberal TV attorneys shaking their heads in disbelief and conservatives claiming yet again that Trump had been exonerated, willfully ignoring the vast holes in my story. This was the pattern that I had grown accustomed to, not just since Trump entered politics, but in all the years I had represented the boss. If you got in a lie, double and triple down, it was the opposite of Ocam's razor. Instead of the simplest explanation being the likeliest, this strategy involved complicating the narrative, throwing sand in the eyes of the onlooker, claiming that transparently implausible stories were true unless proven otherwise. And even then, denying the obvious truth, it was a variation of the old joke, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? It was surprisingly effective over time. If you're willing to be brazen and relentless, it helped if you would never truly thought about the past or the consequences of lying. And if you always lived in the present tense, like a shark swimming through water, only able to survive through constant motion. Underneath my defiance stance lay the bedrock of what I had learned at the foot of Donald Trump when trouble arose. Just say fuck you. (laughs) That is funny. The cold February morning. I was waiting outside my place at the Trump Park Avenue to meet a wealthy businessman friend to fly to Nevada. My friend was going to Las Vegas to praise a commercial property for sale with a price in excess of $1 billion and at the last moments, he'd invited me to join him to solicit my opinion on the deal and to give me a respite from the incessant swirl of scandal that had come to define my life. I had long inhabited the world of private jets, but as I sat in the SUV and looked over the prospectus for the property, my friend r- regaled me excitedly about features of this ultra lush G550 Gulfstream. See, even Michael Jackson, he was such a big celebrity. Most people just loved him like crazy. And to this day, they would. But like all the thing that happened with him, many people don't want to believe it. Nobody wants to believe that he slept with kids. Or if you're a fan, you just don't want to believe things. You're such a big fan. And that has happened forever. But people have shortcomings. Driving through light Saturday morning midtown traffic, we emerged from Lincoln Tunnel en route to Terreboro Airport in New Jersey when my cell phone rang. It was President Trump. I, was, I wasn't surprised. He was a president, but we still spoke often, particularly lately, with the headlines crowded with salacious details about the president's alleged affair with a porn star and my role in paying Daniel's hush money. For more than a decade, I had been Trump's fixer, through thick and thin, but this latest scandal was perhaps the hardest one I have ever confronted. As it involved Trump as the leader of the United States government and all of the complications and jeopardies that included, over the years I had become fluent in the language Trump used to communicate his desires and demands. He used inferences, nods, silences, euphemism, signals. It was similar to how Trump never use email for the simple reason that it created a digital fingerprint that would permanently record his words and thus potentially ensnare him unlike hillary clinton and she had to delete stuff like a crime boss trump wanted to trump trump wanted no evidence that could connect him to any of his deeds or deeds that he indirectly or directly ordered others to do. The same applied with conversations. If the president explicitly said 
that he wanted or needed, it could potentially be used against him. Better to say nothing that could be held against you, but surround yourself with people who can translate your intentions. Trump's mind was so permeated with deception and delusion of others, but also of himself, that I had to be prepared to literally depart from reality and enter kind of a fantasy land when I spoke with the president. Michael, my man, how are you? Trump said. I'm well, Mr. President, I replied, waiting to get the signals I was sure were coming. How are things in D.C.? Good, all good, Trump said. Listen, I have Melania on the line with us. Hi, Michael, the First Lady said. Melania Trump didn't sound pleased to be on the phone. I knew Mr. Trump well, and I could tell in instantly from her tone of the voice that she had compelled to participate in the call. The reason for her reluctance were the understandable. In the press, I had claimed that I had paid Daniels for my own funds as a way to protect Donald Trump, a kind of selfless act meant to protect the then candidate from a scurrilous and false accusation of sexual infidelity in the hot house days before the election. My claim was risible on its face, but that was how the game was played. I knew. Lies followed lies followed lies, a spiral of logic that inevitably sullied me and everyone else involved. But I sensed that the, the degrading process was about to hit yet another new low, and I was desperate to spare the first lady from the humiliating charade that I could see was about to be played out. To me, Melania was the epitome of class. Her life was dedicated to being a mother to Baron, and she was never shy about letting everyone know that including DJT, that's part of what made lying to her so difficult. Over the years, Mr. Trump would repeatedly have me call Melania to reform his innocence when he was accused of cheating on her. I'm sure she freaking knew. At the urging of the president, I started to recite the same story I had told the New York Times. It was sickening that I was lying to another man's wife about the man's infidelity. Crossing so many boundaries of basic decency, it boggled the mind. But what else should he have done? The lies kept compounding because I had been forced to lie to my wife about the funds, taking money out of her home equity line of credit on our Park Avenue apartment to disguise the use of money. As I've said, Laura ran our family's finances, and she wasn't going to agree to spend a large amount of her money to cover up Donald Trump's sexual escapades, whether I was going to be reimbursed or not, as they well knew. As I talked, it, was, it seemed to me that it was almost like Trump believed the lies himself, as he might actually believe that he had in sex with Stormy Daniels in 2006. Oh God, like, let go. It's like 2018 and we are talking about 2006. It's like Stormy only came after Donald Trump for money. Like whether Donald is good or bad, she's like worse ever. Worse ever. At the very least, Trump didn't care about the truth. In if facts didn't suit him, he denied them, changed them, invented them, and then seemingly believed them to hell with reality, and I willingly played along. But that was only part of the strange marital dance. Like many wealthy women with unfaithful husbands, it appeared to me that Mr. Trump preferred not to know that her partner really was what her partner really was up to, to be forced to think about the implications of this behavior for their marriage and their son and her sense of dignity. I think like Hillary Clinton didn't leave either i think that the successful women sorry the women who marry successful men they just take it for granted that they'll have lots of women so they just stay anyway as i duly recited the lines about paying daniels myself at trump's prompting speaking in the tone of a highly responsible attorney who had selflessly protected his client from the slings and the arrows of vicious liars and scammers and their sleazy attorneys trump interrupted wait are you telling me that you paid one thirty thousand from your own pocket he said to me incredulously again knew precisely what to say i did sir i said 
repeating again the lines about my sacrifice to protect the Trump campaign and my mentor's reputation and marriage and good name. Leading me on, Trump then asked a specific question about the Daniels accusation. Trump and I had been talking about the alleged affair since October 2011 when the story about Daniels first surfaced in a blog called TheDirty.com and the magazine called Life and Style. Now Trump asked about my first interactions with attorney Keith Davidson and then represent, who then represented Mr. Dan, Ms. Daniels as I dutifully recited how I had made the blog take down the reports about Trump and the porn star years earlier with signed denials with signed denials from both parties i explained how i had fought on trump's behalf to silence such a libelous and predatory fake story feeling badly about boldly lying to mr mrs trump but also sure i had no choice of course he was in love with trump anyway as i drew droned on about daniel's affair i was interrupted by the first lady i know all of this she said curtly i stopped talking shaking my head it was evident to me that she didn't believe the story or want anything further to do with the transparent lies the president was childishly attempting to tell her via me as usual with the trumps when this kind of subject came up in my experience the first lady changed the subject this time to her son Baron and his new school in Washington. I was on board of I was on board on Baron's school in Manhattan and had played an active role in making sure the youngest Trump had an excellent experience there. So the subject of education was safe territory for us. Mrs. Trump said the Baron loved his new school in DC and I said how happy I was to hear that. I hope to see you the next time you're in the White House, Miss Trump, Mrs. Trump said. So like, she didn't want to hear about it. So she probably just secluded, so what? And like, it happened years ago, so she must know Trump who he is. I hope to see you the next time you're at the White House, Mrs. Trump said. And with that, she hung up. With the president remaining on the line, the president and I could have considerated, commiserated about how the attempt to fool the first lady hadn't worked, like a couple of frat bros lamenting the demands of women. We could have strategized about our next step in, de in deceiving the nation about the true nature of the Daniels transaction. At the very least, we could have acknowledged the reality that two grown men, one the most powerful on the planet, had engaged in an inane and hopelessly inept attempt to lie. But that wasn't how Trump operated. That would have required some self-awareness. He would have to say out loud that we both knew we are lying. Instead, as always, Trump in insisted we keep up the charade as if life itself was a vast, ongoing, never-ending game of deception. You're the best, Michael, Trump said. Keep fighting this fight, and I will be seeing you soon. Thank you for the call, Mr. President, I said. Hanging up, my friend turned to me. Had he only heard one side of the conversation, but even to him, it was obvious what had transpired. Do you think she believed you, my friend asked? Not a chance, I said. Not a chance. Here's an idea. Why don't I spare you all the nonsense involving Michael Avenatti and me? I hope the reviewers will take note of this tender mercy. Well, Avenatti was taunting me on television and calling me an idiot, all leading to his own seemingly inevitable downfall. I was getting the best form of revenge possible. I was living well. After the election, I had set myself up in New York office of square patent box a top tier law firm located at rockefeller plaza a strategic alliance which really meant the partners could brag to their clients that the personal attorney to the president of the united states was part of their outfit i was also using my company essential consultants to break to take on clients like at&t 
Novartis, Columbus Nova, and BTA Bank. High-level companies desperate for insights and connection to the president and willing to pay for an in- assistance. Was I cashing in on my relationship with Trump? Of course I was. What would you do? By March of 2018, to give but one example, I was brokering deals at the level of global multi-million dollar transaction. Down in Palm Springs, Palm Springs, I met with Franklin Haney, a Memphis businessman who'd long been Democrat, but who gave dollar one million to Trump's inaugural com- committee and hired me to help fiance finance a proposed nuclear power plant in Alabama. Haney also needed a ton of federal approvals to complete the project, which was here, which was where I came in to help and guide his attorney greasing the wheel of commerce and government. These were super yacht types of people, and that constituted my reality under President Trump. So all the cable TV yapping from Avenatti and the two toots on liberal cable networks were like water off a duck's back. The real reason I'd come to Florida was to meet with Hamid bin Jassim, who had been the Prime Minister of Qatar from 2007 to 2013, the Foreign Minister from 1992 to 2013, and the CEO of Qatar Investment Authority, or QIA, from 2005 to 2013. But those titles didn't remotely describe his real authority as the single person responsible for the disposition of the QIA's 320 billion fund. Uh, That made him perhaps the only human being on the planet with power compared to Vladimir Putin when it came to money and decision making. Hamad bin Jassim. At the time, Qatar was being isolated by the Saudi Kingdom, as I was trying to put Hamad in good graces of the President of the United States as a way for the tiny mega-rich emirate to hedge their geopolitical risk. <coughs> I'm gonna have a sip of water. Okay, he hasn't talked so much about about him yet, about Dan, about Stormy Daniel. There he was going into Marco Lago as the power broker who had set up a meal between one of the richest men in the world and the President of the United States. And I had done it with incredible ease. Why did he have to plan up? That was what I was talking about when I wrote about the mesmerizing effect of being around Trump. For all the bullshit and bluster, he really was running the world. And I was really, an incre- and, it, and I really was an incredible, unbelievably, insanely powerful attorney and fixer on an intergalactic plane of existence. The dining room was packed with billionaires like Nelson Peltz, and I keep Pearl Mutter, but in that crowd, we don't even know all these people. But in that crowd, Trump was a god amongst gods. In the middle of the room, there was a single table surrounded by red velvet rope to isolate it from the others. And there was there were three places set on the table: one for the president, one for Hamad, and one for me. The most powerful, the richest, and yours truly, a reality that I still can't quite fathom to this day. Trump was likewise in a fantasy land, and I could tell he had, he always had rich people floating around him, but now he was literally the center of the attention, as he had always wanted to be. The truth was that I felt like a billion dollars. I was unstoppable, I figured. All I had to do was ask, and there I was, with one of the richest men in the world, differentially awaiting the leader of the free world. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, one of the staff members announced, and it came, and then came Trump to a standing ovation. The only thing I can compare to the rapturous reception to was the way North Koreans bow and scrape at the sight of Kim, Kim Jong-un. Hamas, you're one of the richest men in the world, Trump said by way of introduction as he reached the Trump and said, you know my lawyer, Michael. The acknowledgement made me feel special for sure. The conversation ranged from Middle East geopolitics to the economy. Hamad bin Jassim had deep knowledge about the needs of the region and the underlying reason for the Sunni Shia division and the war in Yemen. And there's a picture of Trump with Hamad bin Jassim. He just looks like an ordinary man. Uh, and the Emir talked about ISIS and Hezbollah and, and Iran and just ness of the cause of the Houthi insurgents in Yemen. Jared Kushner was working on a plan for an overall peace in the Middle East, at least in theory. But here an Emir was going directly to Trump to ensure that his views on the most pressing existential questions facing his nations were heard. He had good reason to want the meeting. Trump was close, but the young Saudi leader Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, and the Saudis hated the Qataris, so Hamad meeting with Trump was an opportunity to in infinite value. Hmm. Shrimp cocktails, cocktails, streak, steak, grilled salmon, the food was always excellent in Trump's properties. And the dinner went on for a couple of hours with my opinion sought for on various questions by the president and Hamad. I could feel everyone in the room staring at the three of us at the table reverentially. So you think Avenatti and the porn star were on my mind? You think the nitwit calling me an idiot had an impact? I mean, who was the real idiot? I felt like I was starring at a Powerball ticket staring at a Powerball ticket and I had all the correct numbers and the jackpot was 700 million. I was sure that Donald Trump had my back and in the end the whole Stormy Daniels mess would be a storm in a teacup. Nothing would happen to me. I was sure no matter what. As Trump, huh, as Trump, Hamad and I made our way through the room after eating, I made sure to introduce him to Franklin Haney. The developer who was going to pay me a broker fee of 10 million plus a suitable sizable 15 percent interest in the company if i assisted him in getting money for his nuclear plant ahmad bin jas jasin jasin had just undertaken to invest up to 245 billion in the united states so a simple of two billion in Haney's project summarized not only reasonable but highly likely. Two million? Two billion. A few days later I was back in Manhattan at the hotel rooms I had taken for family while we fixed up our apartment in Trump Park Avenue after a broken pipe in a neighborhood's place had burst. I wasn't on the lam as some have suggested as my wife and were estranged when I woke up early morning of April 9, 2018 and roused my son Jake 6 a.m. with a mixture of KISS and WWE wrestling movies. It, I had made coffee, coffee and oatmeal and turned the TV and started to flip through New York Times. How does he know what he made? By 7, Jake had gone to school, and I was walking around in Nike shorts and Laura in her dressing gown when there was a knock out the door. 
How do I? How do you remember what you ate? I looked through the peeping hole and saw a crowd of men in the hallway folding up badges. Oh, there are only three pages left. FBI, Mr. Cohen, one of them said, please open the door. Stepping inside as I obliged, two of the men grabbed me at my waist to immobilize me. It's okay, the lead agent said. Everything is fine. The lead agent explained that they had a warrant for the three hotel rooms and my family occupied, along with my cell phone's office, safe deposit box, law office, and apartment. We know you have firearms, the lead agent said to me. How many? Two, I said. Loaded. Yes, I replied, but not chambered. I showed them to the nightstand where I kept both Glocks, the 40 caliber and 9 mm. To say I was in shock would be a huge understatement. I had no clue I was the target of an investigation or that Mueller's special counsel had taken an interest in me. I was still the regular contact with President I was still in regular contact with President Trump and in his good graces and the attorney we had retained for a joint defense in case an issue came up and assured me that I wasn't on the agenda for the prosecutions then being conducted in secret. The Avenatti nonsense wasn't going full throttle. I knew, but it was all white noise to me. I had just had dinner at Margalago with the president and one of the richest men in the world. I was bulletproof, I thought. There were two dozen agents swarming the hotel and pulling all the books and records off the shelf, downloading my computers, going through my drawers, shooting photographs with talk, taking personal items. My first thought as I watched and disbelieved was simple. What the fuck? Am I El Chapo all of a sudden? Some narcotic trafficker outlaw on most wanted list? Laura and I just sat on the bed and watched the news on TV. We're talking heads were holding forth on Stormy Daniels and me, obviously to the raid and what was about to become the single biggest story in the world. You don't have to stay here, the lead agent. You're not under arrest. You don't. Do you guys want coffee, I asked. How long does this last? It will be as quick and painless as possible, the lead agent said. Thanks for the offer, but we're okay. Thank you for waiting until my son went to school, I said. I was now on the other side of the power dynamic. I had exploited so often on behalf of Donald Trump that effectively, I was effectively in the position of EJ writings or a Trump mortgage. All those years, also having my reality dictated to me in real time. In the 1980s, along with a handful of parking tickets, but that was the sum total of all my brushes with the law. I never had been any kind of trouble, and now there was FBI agents going through my couches and scratching the drapes and searching the drapes. What the hell are they looking for, Laura asked. I have no choice. I have no clue. I said, let them look all they want. My second thought was that I had to go, I had to get word to Mr. Trump. I asked for my phone to make calls, but they refused. I said, I just want to retrieve the private number of the President of the United States, but they said I couldn't touch the phone. I asked them to at least let me retrieve the number, so I instructed them how to find the number and then read it to me. I was worshipped, oh sorry, I was worried that the President would hear about the raid from a third party and go insane. Two hours passed and then my daughter Samantha walked through the door to a great surprise asking what the hell was all going on Shit. last page of this chapter and the chapter name is typhoon stormy part three after the five hours of fbi agent left carrying boxes loaded with my possessions i went directly to the at&t store on lexington avenue and brought a new phone using my old number and I called Madeline Westerhout at the White House. Tell the president that my hotel and apartment and law office and safe deposit box have been raided by the FBI, I said. The president will be notified immediately, she said. Minutes later, 
My phone rang. It was the president. Michael, are you and the family okay? He asked. So, the president was concerned about him. Yes, Mr. President, I, pre- I replied. I have no idea where this is coming from. I have no idea why this has happened. They're coming after all of us, Trump said. This is all part of the witch hunt. Stay strong. I have your back. You're going to be fine. Thank you for your call and concern. So, Trump did support him for quite some time. Thank you for your call and concern, I said. The President of the United States hung up. The words, I have your back, ringing in my ears. That was Trump's mantra and ex- exhortation. The President had my back. If I stayed loyal to Trump, he would stay loyal to me. I had to, to stay the course, always stay the course, be loyal. I was going to be fine. But in the back of my mind, I knew trouble was coming. That afternoon, I had watched the President sitting in a long table in the White House talking to the press. Trump spoke about the FBI raid on in my office and apartment when it reminds me of Puff Diddy. What worried me, so they go to the different places all together so that you have no time to react. What worried me knowing how he speaks and acts and thinks was that Trump had described me as one of my personal attorneys. All of a sudden, I didn't have a name. All of a sudden, I'm only one of his attorneys. This was how Trump distanced himself from people. I was still blind to the implications, unable to actually acknowledge and confront what I knew in my heart, but a sense of dread began and shrouded my thoughts. This was the last time I ever spoke to Donald Trump. Oh, shit. So, he said I have my back, but then he completely distanced himself. Shit. Oh my God, it gets really bad. Mr. Cohen, please stand up and face the wall, the lead marshal said. What are you talking about, I said. The two probation officers then walked in and issued me with a remand document stating that I had refused to sign the home confinement release and was therefore being taken back into custody. They seemed delighted, even thrilled, despite the fact that the document was premised on false information. I never refused to sign the document We were waiting for their superior's determination, I said. I'll sign it right now. This is ridiculous, Jeff sighed. It's out of our hands, probation officer Pakula said with evident pleasure. We're not involved anymore. This cannot be happening, I said, but it was. I was handcuffed and shackled and taken to the bowels of the building, where I was stripped naked and issued a brown jumpsuit. What? Within hours, I was returned to prison in upstate. Wow, he went through a lot. In upstate New York. Well, so you know, I'm reading the book Disloyal. So he calls himself Disloyal. And he was the one who was disloyal. And he didn't say anything about President Trump being disloyal. Placed in solitary New York, placed in solitary confinement and left to the mercy of the raging COVID-19 and the possibility of dying behind bars with my underlying heart and respiratory health issues. Of course, everybody had that during that time. Let me say for the record, I was never really given the chance to sign the home confinement document. I was in prison because I refused to sign away my rights under the Constitution of the United States. It was a surprise attack by presenting... by presenting me with terms they knew would be impossible for me to agree to. They were springing a trap, as might happen in any authoritarian country, a country where individuals lack the rights of due process and freedom of speech. Within days, my wife found Dania Perry, a former prosecutor and a true criminal lawyer. Dania filed a writ of habeas corpus and an urgency restraining order joined by the American Civil Liberties Union. At a hearing 10 days later, Judge Alvin K. Hallerstein had little patience for the case made by Southern District Prosecutor. I made the, I make the finding that the purpose of transferring Mr. Cohen from furlough to home confinement to jail is retaliatory, the judge said, and it is retaliatory because of his desire to exercise the First Amendment rights to publish a book and to discuss anything about that book or anything else he wants on social media and with others. In the beginning of this book, which I published in full, 
with a full heart i wrote that the president of the united states doesn't want you to read my story now i have the actual proof how how desperate he is to silence and prevent the world from hearing the story and the truth about donald j trump the real real donald j trump I don't know when I read the whole book and I wrote read the last sentence I don't think he portrayed Donald Trump as so evil he portrayed him as um just a rich guy with a lot of money who just has lots of sex and he's crazy about um who he was as a celebrity and he comes across as somebody who just looks up as a to a celebrity He wasn't able to portray him like worse than he was. To me, he did a good job by just owning up that he was disloyal and how he was totally enamored by the president. In a nutshell, all this book is all about is like I love Donald Trump and I lied about it and I gave money. That's all this book is all about and it is like 400 pages of blah blah blah. So, rich people all cheat anyway. So, it wasn't such a big deal. Um I don't know if I can make a decision who should I vote but in time I may